imagine yourself living at a turning point in the life of the world as you know it. One age is ending and another age is beginning. You begin to realize that the world you grew up in, its history, religion, government, social fabric, even its very language is fading away, and your grandchildren will never know this world. The things you feel at home with are gradually becoming obsolete and arcane. What would you do if you suddenly felt that happening to your entire society and way of life? In the 11th century, a Persian poet known as Hakim Abul Qasim Ferdowsi Tusi tried to express this very position in his epic poem, The Shahnameh, better known as the Persian Book of Kings. This epic poem, originally nearly 60,000 couplets, over three times as long as the Iliad, became the most famous work of Persian literature known to the world. Today, it is widely regarded as the national epic of the worldwide Persian-speaking community. Ferdowsi was born into a landed aristocratic family near the city of Tus, located in what is now northeastern Iran. Tus was a major city in Ferdowsi's day, rich in Persian culture. Ferdowsi wrote in Persian when modern Persian was being infiltrated with Arabic words, and when Arabic threatened to replace Persian as the preferred language of literature. Ferdowsi was a Muslim and he knew Arabic, but he was first and foremost a native Iranian with family ties to classical Persian culture. Specifically, Ferdowsi came from a family that held the status of landed gentry or farmers. He took great pride in his local family identity and his Persian cultural heritage. And this is evident in the Persian he used to write the Shanama, a form of Persian without a lot of Arabic included. Before we get into the story of the Shanama, a brief aside about terminology. Properly speaking, Iran is the official legal name of the country formally instituted in 1935, but people often use the names Persia and Iran interchangeably. The country of Iran has roots that go back literally thousands of years. Some say that Iran as an empire has existed in some form since at least the first millennium BCE, if not earlier. For our purposes, I'll use the term Iran to refer to the empire, with the understanding that Persian as an adjective refers more broadly to cultural elements that may go back to the second or even the third millennia BCE. According to scholars, Ferdowsi began the Book of Kings in 977 CE. Legend has it that he undertook the work at age 36 in order to raise money for his daughter's dowry. An apocryphal story states that Ferdowsi was hired at the rate of one gold coin per couplet. When he began the poem, the region Ferdowsi lived in, what we think of as Eastern Iran today, was still under the control of a group that valued its Persian heritage. But by the time Ferdowsi completed the poem, 33 years later, on March 8, 1010, Eastern Iran was under the control of the Ghaznavids, a powerful Muslim dynasty of Turkish origin that gradually took control over a vast expanse of Central and West Asia. In fact, evidence suggests that these changes that influenced Ferdowsi began centuries earlier with the 7th century Muslim conquest of regions of Persia. It's important to note, however, that the Shahnameh should not be thought of as an accurate historical work. Fiction mingles freely with fact in this work. The Shahnameh includes references to historical kings and figures who really lived in Iranian history. But it's also full of mythical creatures, and key characters often are endowed with magical powers. As a result, it's best to think of the Shanama as an epic-length anthology of legends about the kings and heroes in Iranian history, whose stories the author has taken some liberties with in order to celebrate Persian history and culture more broadly. The epic is divided into three main sections, one that describes a mythical age, one that describes a heroic age, and one that describes a historical age. Over the course of these three sections, Ferdowsi traces 50 generations of Persian kings, from the creation of the world up to the death of the last Sassanid ruler and the Muslim conquest of Persia in the 7th century CE. 
the mythical, heroic, and historical material weave in and out of each other, creating one epic literary masterpiece, a national epic that captures history and mythology simultaneously. Ferdowsi opens the Shanama with an introduction praising Allah and describing the creation of the universe. But the meat of the epic is a chronological narrative describing the reigns of the 50 kings. Now, the treatment of the kings is a bit uneven. For example, the discussion of King Kaus, who purportedly ruled over Iran for 150 years, covers over three volumes of the standard nine-volume edition of the Shanama. Now, this is particularly interesting because Kaus is a bad king. He provides an object lesson in what not to do as king. In addition, the book spends a lot of time on figures who are not kings, but rather heroes. In fact, it would be more accurate to title this epic The Book of Kings and Heroes. In part, this is because the heroes are featured as prominently as the kings are, and frankly, their adventures are more interesting. The lives of the kings are also so intimately intertwined with the lives of the heroes that you can't really separate one from another. In this lecture, I want to focus in particular on a couple of heroes and kings, beginning with the hero Rostam of Sistan, who takes center stage in the second major section of the Shanama. That section focuses on the age of the heroes and recounts stories about men who are viewed as the key figures in Iranian ancient history. This material takes up two-thirds of the epic. The Book of Kings describes four dynasties that span the period between the creation of the world and the Islamic conquest. Rostam is born at the dawn of the second dynasty, the Kayanid dynasty. Rostam helps to establish the first king of the Kayanid dynasty on the throne of Iran, and he then serves that king's son and successor, Kaikaus. Kaikaus is proud, impulsive, and a bit foolish, but Rostam serves him loyally. Tragically, this leads to the death of Rostam's own son, and the story of this loss is worth examining in detail. According to the myth, Rostam impregnates another king's daughter during one of his journeys. But Rostam doesn't marry this woman. Instead, he continues on his travels. As we've seen, this isn't unusual for heroes in various cultures. Rostam's son, Sohrab, is born and raised in his mother's family. When Sohrab becomes a young man, he learns that Rostam is his father, and he sets out to depose the king of Iran, that is, Kai Kaus, with the goal of putting Rostam on the throne instead. King Afrasiab encourages Sohrab to attack the king of Iran, but he has his own plan. King Afrasiab understands the role of a hero as one who supports his king. Rostam, as a loyal advisor, will fight on the battlefield defending the king of Iran. Afrasiab hopes that Rostam's son, Sohrab, will kill Rostam on the battlefield, conquering Iran and opening the way for Afrasiab himself to take the throne of Iran. Afrasiab sends a message to the king of Iran designed to provoke him to war. As expected, the king responds in anger, and he sends a message back to Afrasiab declaring, accept your subordinate status and so save your skin. You know well enough that Iran is my land and that the world trembles before my might. No matter how brave a leopard may be, it dare not confront the lion's claws. This arrogant statement enrages Afrasiab. Tensions escalate into war, and eventually, Rostam is forced to fight Sorab man to man. They are evenly matched, and Rostam only defeats Sorab by resorting to trickery. At one point, Rostam gets the upper hand. The poem says that Rostam drives a blade into his own son's heart, not knowing whom he's killing. Once Sorab realizes that he's dying, he reveals himself to his father. He explains that his mother gave him a gift when he was a young man, a memento of his father, an armband. She had hoped that Sorab would use the armband to identify himself to his father and to bring about a happy reunion. Instead, Sohrab had hidden the armband under his armor, out of sight. As Sohrab lies dying, Rostam tears the clothing from his son's body, and he sees the band. 
He sends a messenger to the king, Kaikaus, begging for a healing potion to save his son's life. He orders the messenger to tell the king, Tell him what has befallen us, how with my dagger I have pierced my own son's heart. If he has any memory of my past deeds, then let his heart be moved for a little on my behalf. I ask for him to send me, without delay, a portion of that healing potion that he keeps in his storehouses for healing injured bodies, mixed with a cup of wine. It may be that by the virtue of the king's power, Saurabh may recover. Rostam's king receives the message, but he refuses to send the healing potion, declaring that if he did, he would be nurturing his own enemy. Saurabh dies, and when Rostam returns to his own camp, his men cheer his military victory, but he stops them, declaring that he has killed the person most dear to him in all the world. According to sources outside the Shanama, Afrasiab, the king who sent Saurabh into battle, is eventually defeated himself. He dies later, alone and miserable, hiding in a cave, traditionally believed to be on a mountaintop in Azerbaijan. Rostam is an intriguing figure. He's simultaneously an insider and an outsider. He comes from a family of advisors to kings, so he's part and parcel of the royal world. But he himself is not a king, and he never will be. He's also distinct from other normal men. He and his father live long lives, roughly 500 years each. He's descended from an arch demon or a deev on his mother's side, so he's part demon himself. And all of these elements combine to mark him as an extraordinary being, a prototypical hero. Noble commitments determine his behavior, as the story involving his son Sorab reveals. And in many ways, Rostam is superior to the kings he serves. He's not perfect by any stretch. None of Ferdowsi's heroes are. But he's a role model for the poem's audience at the same time that he's clearly marked as unique. In another section of the epic, Rostam embarks on a series of famous adventures known as the Haft Khan, loosely translated as Seven Feasts, but also known as the Seven Labors. We'll come back to the significance of this title later. These travels are prompted by the capture of Rostam's king, Kaikaus. Kaikaus launched an attack on Mazinderan, the land of the Deves or the demons. In response, the king of Mazinderan called on the great white demon to come to his aid, and the white demon captured Kaikaus. Rostam travels alone to rescue the king, accompanied only by his horse, Raksh, his faithful companion. As Rostam travels the road to rescue the king, he has seven adventures or ordeals. First, he's attacked by a huge lion while he is sleeping. Raksh, however, intervenes and kills the lion. By the time Rostam wakes up, the attack is over, and Raksh has to describe it to his master. Next, the hero nearly dies of thirst while crossing a desert but a ram appears and directs him to an oasis. Third, Rostam is attacked again, this time by a dragon who's guarding the oasis that the ram sent him to. Raksh tries to warn Rostam twice, but Rostam tells Raksh to let him sleep. Finally, Rostam sees the dragon and he kills it with his sword. In the fourth adventure, Rostam comes upon a feast set up near a spring with no one around. Rostam begins to sing about his own adventures, mourning how alone he is. And while he's singing, a beautiful woman appears. He begins to sing of her beauty. He offers her wine. But when he invokes the name of God, her true nature is revealed. She transforms into an ugly, evil woman, and Rostam kills her. Once again, Rostam does not fit our modern-day image of a hero. Slaying a woman just because she turns ugly seems a little harsh. But in the Shanama, as in other mythologies, physical appearances are often cues to a figure's character. Under mythological rules of the game, you usually can't trust a superficially beautiful woman who transforms abruptly into an ugly creature. So Rostam's decision to kill her is understandable in his world. In the fifth adventure, Rostam tells his horse Raksh to run free in a wheat field. 
When the watchman guarding the field complains, Rostam pulls the poor man's ears off. Again, this isn't behavior we expect from modern heroes, but it serves Rostam's purposes. Well, the watchman complains to his master, who sends his guard force to capture Rostam. Instead, Rostam kills all the guards, and then he captures the master, forcing him to disclose where Kai Kaus is being held captive. In the sixth adventure, Rostam is finally brought to Kai Kaus. Rostam kills the troops guarding the captive king, and then he begins to plot an escape. In the final episode, Rostam attacks and kills the white demon who's held Kai Kaus captive. Rostam fulfills his role as the king's loyal protector. There are several really interesting features of these adventures. First, note the fantastic qualities of Raksh, Rostam's horse. Raksh can talk, he can fight, and in one famous episode, he's able to see an ant's footprints on a dark cloth from two leagues away. We're so accustomed to having extraordinary creatures appear in mythology that we don't really even notice them anymore. But Raksh serves an important function. He's a concrete symbol of Rostam's special status. When Rostam purchases the magical horse, he's told by the horse trader that he should make straight the face of the land of Iran while riding on Raksh. Riding upon him, you will straighten out the world. Rostam and Raksh are bound up with one another, so much so that when Rostam's son Sorab chooses a horse, he selects Raksh's foal. Like father, like son, even though a magical foal ultimately can't save Sorab from death by Rostam's own hand. Third, there are some really interesting parallels between Rostam and other heroic figures from ancient mythology. Like the Greek heroes Achilles and Heracles, Rostam is given the choice between a long life without glory or a short life with glory and honor. And like Achilles and Heracles, Rostam chooses a short but honorable life. He declares, to be killed comes more easily to me than the shame of my staying back in any place of battle. There's one more famous story that I have to tell you about the battle between Rostam and Esfandiar, the son of Goshtasp, and the crown prince of Persia. According to the Shanama, Esfandiar was also a supporter of Zarathustra and the religion he founded, Zoroastrianism. It's important to note that Ferdowsi, in celebrating Persian heritage, also celebrated Zoroastrianism. Just as he included Parsi terms instead of Arabic whenever he could, he also included Zoroastrian concepts and ideals in the Shanama. The figure of Sfandiar is presented as a supporter of Zarathustra in the myth, and he's given special status as an almost invincible warrior. Some have argued that Sfandiar represents Zoroastrianism in the epic, created by Ferdowsi as a metaphor for the Zoroastrian worldview. The story of Rostam and Sfandiar is one of the longest stories in the epic poem, and one of the most famous episodes. According to the legend, Isfandiar's father, King Goshtasp, promised his son the throne if he could stop an invasion in a far-off province of the kingdom. Isfandiar succeeds, and he returns expecting to be given the throne. However, the king is not really anxious to hand over his throne, so he devises ways to put his son off. Now, this is only one of many times in the epic that a father and a son disagree on when the son should ascend the throne. In order to avoid giving up the throne, King Goshtasp sends his son on another journey, this time to thwart a rebellion in another faraway region. And again, Esfandiar is successful. Finally, Goshtasp sends his son on a third mission. This time, he asks his son to bring back the famous hero Rostam in chains, claiming that Rostam has been disrespectful to the king, challenging his authority. Now, what makes this request really interesting is that King Goshtasp has been warned in a prophecy that Rostam will kill Esfandiar. But Esfandiar is completely unaware of this. Initially, Esfandiar refuses to go, arguing that as far as he knows, Rostam has been a loyal servant to the king's household. But Goshtasp will not change his mind, so Esfandiar, ever the obedient son, 
sets out to capture Rostam. When Asfandiar reaches Rostam's home, he demands that Rostam surrender into his custody to be led away in chains. Not surprisingly, Rostam refuses. And this leads to a ferocious battle between the two warriors. Initially, Rostam is wounded, and he begs to leave the field of battle to have his wounds tended to. At this time, the mystery, mystical creature Simurg gives Rostam counsel. Simurg is a giant winged creature, usually depicted as a peacock with the head of a dog and lion claws. She tells Rostam that Asfandiar can only be defeated by a weapon made from the wood of a special tree. Now conveniently, this tree will also heal Rostam's wounds. Rostam is healed, and then he fashions a double-headed arrow from the tree. Before Rostam returns to the battlefield, though, there's one more twist. Years previously, the prophet Zarathustra had declared that whoever killed Isfandiar would be cursed for the remainder of his life. And after death, this person would be condemned to hell. Simurg warns Rostam about the fate that awaits the man who kills Isfandiar. Rostam considers the curse, but he decides the shame of surrendering in battle is too great. He will not give up. When Rostam returns to the battlefield, he shoots Isfandiar through the eyes, and Isfandiar falls to the ground, fatally wounded. As Isfandiar dies, he reassures Rostam. Isfandiar declares that the ones who killed him were really Simurg, who gave Rostam the fatal arrow, and his own father, King Goshtasp, who sent him into battle. Goshtasp failed his son by failing to fulfill his promise to relinquish the throne. Isfandiar breathes his last, having acquitted Rostam of his murder. Esfandiar's honor is upheld even in death. Washington, Esfandiar's brother, leads the army back to King Goshtasp. Esfandiar's horse is led forward, riderless, and with the saddle reversed, and with its mane and tail cut off, in honor of its missing owner. Esfandiar's armor hangs from the horse's side. When Washington comes into the presence of the king, he declares loudly for all to hear, Neither the Simurg, nor Rostam, nor Zal have made an end of Isfandiar, but you, you alone, for you alone have caused him to perish. Goshtasp's betrayal of his own son is made public. At this point, it's helpful to return to a point I raised earlier. Both Rostam and Isfandiar are credited with Hoth Khan tradition, that is a storyline of seven adventures or ordeals culminating in the successful completion of their tasks. Rostam, as we have seen, was sent to rescue his king from captivity. In the parallel series of adventures before his death, Asfandiar is sent to rescue his sisters, who were also taken captive. Hoft Khan, however, literally means seven feasts or seven courses. And it doesn't take much research to determine that these stories were originally part of an oral tradition meant to be told by minstrels to guests reclining at a meal. The seven episodes in Rostam and Asfandiar's quests parallel the seven courses of an ancient Persian formal banquet meal. The storyteller lays out a seven-course epic spread for the audience to hear, and they feed on the stories of their mythic ancestors. Rostam and the other Shanama heroes are far more than entertainment at a banquet, though. They are the meat of ancient Persian culture, presented by the minstrel as spiritual food, strengthening the audience to keep the hero's stories alive into the present generation. The Book of the Kings includes many more stories, but the stories of Rostam and Asfandiar capture the spirit of the overall epic. It's a tradition that relates the history of a people, but it's also a poem about heroes, valor, and honor. In the epic, Ferdowsi sought to capture the rich culture that he knew in a form that would endure. In one passage, he writes, The houses that are the dwelling of today will sink beneath shower and sunshine to decay. But storm and rain shall never mar the palace that I have built with my poetry. 
One interpretation argues that Ferdowsi was trying, in this epic poem, to capture the golden days of Persian culture and to pass them on to the next generation. Of course, golden days are often remembered more generously than they actually were, and we know that the stories Ferdowsi's epic records aren't straight history. It may be more accurate to say that Ferdowsi was trying to inspire a new generation by invoking a perfect age that never really existed, but that deserves to be sought after. And of course, the Shanama isn't alone in this. We've seen that mythological traditions tend to editorialize about the past. Mythology is never pure history. It's always intended to provide an interpretive lens, instructing the audience on how to make sense of the world. Mythology is meaning-making, value-making, and as such, it often arranges the facts to suit its interpretive purposes. Because of its grand scope and classical Persian language, the Shanama is considered a great literary work of ancient Persian culture, if not the greatest Persian literary work, along the lines of Shakespeare. But the Book of Kings is also tremendously influential in day-to-day -day Iranian culture. Parents name their children after characters in the epic. Grandparents entertain their grandchildren with adventures from the book. In this way, it's much like the Mahabharata in Indian culture. In the foreword to one English translation, the Iranian-American author and scholar Azar Nafisi describes how her father raised her with the adventures of Rostam, Esfandiar, and other characters. This was more than entertainment, her father argued that Persian culture had no homeland in any geographic space. The Shanama was the home for Persians. He said that whenever the Persian people had been attacked or displaced, the poets acted as custodians of ancient Persian history, culture, and language, safeguarding all of it in their poetry. We have no other home but this, she writes. The Book of Kings is our home, always. This same writer comments that during the Iran-Iraq War, she took refuge in the pages of this book. She writes that for Persians, the Shanama is like their identity papers. When the land is taken away, the Shanama proves that the great Persian people still exist. A final note on Ferdowsi. I mentioned earlier that Ferdowsi wrote the Shanama in part to raise funds at the rate of one gold coin per verse. It was the Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi who agreed to be Ferdowsi's patron. When it came time for the Sultan to pay Ferdowsi for the work he'd completed, however, according to one tradition, the Sultan tried to cheat Ferdowsi, paying him in silver coins instead of gold, in effect paying the poet such a small amount that Ferdowsi was insulted. Later, Ferdowsi moved to another region, and he came under the patronage of a different ruler. At that point, the poet is said to have written the following verses insulting the first sultan. Long years the Shanama I toiled to complete, that the king might award me some recompense meet. But nothing, save a heart wrung with grief and despair, did I get from those promises empty as air. Had the sire of the king been some prince of renown, my forehead would surely have been graced by a crown. Were his mother a lady of high pedigree, in silver and gold I'd have stood to the knee. But, being by birth not a prince but a boor, the praise of the noble he could not endure. Ferdowsi eventually returned to Tus, his home city, for the last years of his life, and he died there. A millennium later, he's still remembered and celebrated for this work. In fact, you can visit his mausoleum and a museum in his honor in Tus today. But the most enduring memorial to him is the Book of the Kings itself. It concludes, I've reached the end of this great history, and all the land will fill with talk of me. I shall not die. These seeds I've sown will save my name and reputation from the grave. And men of sense and wisdom will proclaim when I have gone, my praises, and my fame. I'm always struck by this passage 
because it reveals how the poet hoped to remain immortal in the works of his pen. The poetry will endure long after the poet and long after the poet's cultural world. As we've seen, the Shanama sings the praises of ancient Persian kings and heroes. But indirectly, it also praises the poet, the one figure who can make kings and heroes immortal, along with the worlds they inhabited and mastered. A thousand years after Ferdowsi watched his world begin to change, we have a poetic snapshot to remember it by.